when when I was given the opportunity to do this, I was just so delighted. Uh, Kathy and I live at 1809 Park Drive, just two houses away from Mary Lou. She has been dear to us for 50 or more years. Uh, we loved Carl. We love her. Uh, Mary Lou is great. She can get stuff done. She loves radiators, don't you, Mary Lou? <laughs> and we love radiators. Okay. She likes old houses. She likes concrete dogs. <laughs> you like, we, and, and our grandchildren would go to see your concrete dogs so many times that when you were leaving, we got a concrete dog in our backyard. That's right. <laughs> and somebody wondered why we didn't breed them. Yeah. <laughs> One day I thought there might be little concrete puppies going from there. there. Uh, uh, we're gonna t we've talked about the topics that we're going to talk about. We went over to the uh, North Carolina State Archives and looked at uh, what Mary Lou has donated over there. And Marion Wasson wanted me to make sure to mention to you the the lovely things that uh, Mary Lou has given to the State Archives and the Raleigh Museum. Uh, if you want to know about what happened in Cameron Park uh, over the last some odd years, and I'll never say Oxford Park tonight. We, we're talking about Cameron Park when we're talking about this, okay? So uh, I'll probably never say Oxford Park anyhow, but that's another story. I've got a bunch of questions to ask her, and we're just going to get started. So when did you get here? Oh, about half an hour ago. <laughs> And who brought you? Chuck. Chuck, okay. And somebody else asked me, how old are you? Man or woman? <laughs> uh, it was a woman. A, a, okay. woman who, a woman who said, I can't believe she looks like that. She looks so good. How old is she now? All right. I, I worked my way up to 93. All right. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so where were you born? I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. To a family of you have brothers and sisters? I was the first one. First one. There's a family story about that. Uh, whether it's true or not, I don't know, because I was there, but I wasn't there, if you know what I mean, having just been born. <laughs> and so uh, the story is that Dad came to see his first son child, and he looked at me, and he looked at Mom, and she, and he said, you know, I have black hair and you have brown hair and she's a blonde. But I'll tell you what, we've waited nine months so we'll just keep it. <laughs> That's pretty good. Good guy. Where, where did you and Carl meet? Well, we met in uh, Garfield High School. I don't know whether around here you all had those such things. Uh, what would happen is the school counselors would get, would invite colleges from nearby uh, surrounds and uh, to go, come to a particular high school and then the college representatives would come and the students and their parents would meet with us. So it was at Garfield, New Jersey High School that Carl and I met. And you were representing? Douglas College, which was a woman's branch of Rutgers in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And Carl was representing? Uh, Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken. And, and that was it? That's when it all, you got that, just... That, yeah. yeah. When, where, where did you move from to get to Cameron Park? Okay. So, uh, well, I'll make it quick. We moved here from Vermont, but there's a trail that got us to Vermont. Okay. You, 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 have a, you had a place in Vermont, too. We did. We did. You, you built that yourselves? Well, that was, came later. I'll, I'll just say something if it seemed a proper place to insert the first year of our marriage all right we were married in april 22nd of 1960. after which we um we moved to vermont and we rented a house and then we bought a house no we rented a house then we bought a house in underhill vermont and then on february the 22nd our first son was born and then we had our first anniversary on April the 22nd <laughs> of 61. So, Sun Phil came later. Yeah, that's great. So, so when you came here, Carl came to work for the university, right? Mm -hmm. Or was it still State College? 
uh, on, uh, when was it, 67? Yeah. Well, people refer to it. I don't know whether, I think it may have changed its name. You all would know better. Yeah. So wh what got you interested in moving to Cameron Park? Why did you move to Cameron Park? Well, um, for one thing, this is what I kind of put together because Carl, I was out of town and Carl, when I got home, said he had seen a house he thought I'd be interested in. My sense is that since his office was in Peel Hall, that he probably spent time and his colleagues would acquaint him with, with the area. So Carl had seen the house and when I came uh, home, he took me to see it. And then, so why do you decide on a particular house? And I read somewhere about, you have to think in terms of a shoe. When it fits, you know it. <laughs> so that seemed like a fit. Yeah. Did Carl ever, he always walked to work, didn't he? That's right, yes. He, he, as I said, he was in Peel Hall and then later was down in, uh, what was the old cafeteria on Dan Allen Drive? Went down there, but he still walked. Our block was actually, it was a really good block for people who were at the university. A lot of university George people. Wise was. Dr. Shunk, IVD Shunk, who owned our house before we bought yeah. it. And the people who built our house, aren't they? The, yeah. Who were they? The rat? Uh, yeah. I had it written down yeah, here. <laughs> it's written in my head here. Okay, somewhere. I've got it on paper here. Randolph. Randolph. Right. Uh, uh, also, Wilson. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Sidney Ann Wilson. Yeah. Her dad. Her dad, yeah. And we had for a short time later on, Bill Johnson came in the party. Well, the Johnsons were there when we moved. When we, when, yeah. when we moved in. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, let me ask you a different kind of question. What do you do when you encounter a problem? I, I know the answer to this question. Did you have one in mind? I, I, my, ex <laughs> my experience with you has been that you fix it. You analyze it and you fix it. Oh, I do a lot of analyzing because <laughs> I want it to win. <laughs> I want it to come out the way I want it to come out. And yeah. so I agonize over that a lot. Yeah, but if I think it's right, by gum, you'll do it, won't you? Yeah. What was the neighborhood? What was the neighborhood like when you and Carl moved in? Well, it was beginning to look like a pair of shoes that maybe needed to go to the shop. Uh, but other, but in in the main, fairly respectable, uh, you know, possibility. And Carl had grown up in a small town outside of Chillicothe, Ohio. And I had grown up in the village outside of uh, Cincinnati. And both of them had been established situations. So you, it, and I think if you have an established situation or something that you know of that's old, you can smell it, can't you? You just know. And it has a special feel. And, the, and you can't have that feeling if you have not lived in an old place or something that doesn't necessarily seem permanent because permanent has a fluctuating definition, right? So that's uh. We well, had, you know you had, you had lots of, yeah. You did. You had lots of good neighbors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that excludes him. <laughs> well, you know, we we moved in in '74, and we thought we were in the wrong place because if you went up and down the street, here's who Kathy thought she was in the wrong. Place. Our our neighbors were Marie Wise, Marion Gregory, Mary Lee McMillan, Miriam Smith, Mariah Pegram, Mary Schofield, Mary Prather, and Mary Lou Ike. <laughs> in, in, in those two blocks, there were one, two, three, four, five, eight Marys. And I may have missed one. There may be another one that I overlooked. Well, I noticed she stopped at the corner there. <laughs> yep. Yep. I, that's, that's as far as we need to go. Oh, okay. Uh, it seemed to me the first time I met you, you were <laughs> because you found a rat in your basement. <laughs> <laughs> That's another. That's another story. No, sorry. You can you can you can come back and interview me about that later. But I killed one of them. I'll tell you that. Um, the general condition of the neighborhood. What was it like? Well, uh, as I say, the, it, look, it looked a little in need of attention. It really did. But it seemed secure, and the buildings were not dilapidated or falling down or anything like that. And so. It, it really, when you think about it, we're very blessed to think that there were persons like Al Adams and Dick Wilkinson, and I don't know who the other people are, that 
took notice of that and saw the possibility of it and put their energies and their skills and their education to, to the purpose of it, rebirthing it. Were they still for the new house? Uh, there were some. I was trying to remember. Yeah, there, yeah, there, there, were, there, some, there, yeah. Were, there were some. Uh, but Carl used to tell me stories about how that unknown to Mrs. Shunk, that Dorothea Dix had turned our house into a halfway house. Okay. So, uh, uh, now that was the other thing, Carl. Before he became financial aid officer, was although they, he was his title was director of student activities, he actually was a dean of men in the circumstances where that's what you call the person. So he knew those kind of things. Yeah. Well, in '69, the neighborhood formed an association, mm -hmm. Cameron Park Association, and it it uh, it sort of had some beginnings uh, in the uh, university. Fred Eichenberger, who taught in the school of design, was, was involved in it. Um, well, well, if you have a share, yes. you have a share of the corporation the because the there corporation. were, there were, there were two things. There were, Mary Lou and I were talking about that. There were, there was a corporation. You still have a share? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we still have a share in the uh, lockbox somewhere. It's, yeah, right. They, what do we do? <laughs> we weren't. We weren't. Folk, we were doing exactly what we were supposed to do. Just pay for it and hold on to it, because it provided the, the funds for some of the activity of of holding houses and that kind of activity for. So they would have an opportunity to be sold and brought back into compliance with the zoning. One of the one one of the, one of the groups of houses were the Tudor. Up, uh, right. Apartments down there right now, right? Mm -hmm. That was a corporation that went in and, uh -huh. and bought I that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think there were 18 housing units within those four. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, they yeah. they've been cut up inside that. Like 18 that was owned by a man from in the textile business, I think. Yeah. So, what were some of the 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 what about street names? We ever have a problem with street names? Well. Yes, there was. No, I'm trying to think what they want to change it to is the one thing I can't remember. But my sense of it was that the city had hired a new fellow on the name the street thing. It had no sense of of how these names were or why they were or anything like that. So there was an effort. My recollection is that Joe Griner, I think, headed that committee that uh, fought that issue. And so the, the name changed, but I can't remember what. They, I think that the idea was that they wanted to change us and Park Avenue. They, they said Park Avenue got their name first, and so Park That's Drive right. has to give up their name. And you remember the speech that Joe Griner made down at Begley, the yeah. city hall? We we went to we went to the uh, we went to the city council, and I didn't have much hope in what Joe was going to do. But he stood up and he made his his pitch for us, which was good. And then I think he asked everybody. Who had lived on Park Drive for 60 years to stand up, <laughs> and, and I think the Schofield stood up and some other people, and then 40 and 30, and, and by that time the whole city council just had a big smile on their face, and <laughs> we knew that. I never did know if that guy kept his job or not. Did you? No, I don't know. He he probably probably went someplace else to a different neighborhood. What? Well, what, the, one of the other things that we struggled with early on. Uh, were people parking in the neighborhood, especially for this? The, most of this happened, I think, from Woodburn, uh, Woodburn West. Yeah, it went down at least one block before us, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, from my understanding, the idea of restrictive parking zones uh, had its birth in Chapel Hill. That was my understanding about it. And so, um, what the way it worked is that we had to, to buy decals in order, and maybe it's still true, I don't know. Uh, so he bought a, a permit that allowed you to park, and I believe it was $5 to start $5, off for, yeah. for a year. Persons who did not have that could park for two hours in the neighborhood. And in the old days, <laughs> when, with all this mechanical stuff, so there was a, a, a traffic officer that went around, and she had uh, like a golf cart type thing. So she had to go around, observe this, mark the tires, and then two hours later, come back and see and write and handwrite the tickets. It was very time consuming, but anyway, it was accomplished. But there, there were examples of um, 
for example, a fellow who parked his car right by our place. And every day he would get a ticket. And so you could look in the vehicle and their console was filled with them. <laughs> and why they never came and put the lock on his wheel, I have no idea. But every month his folks would go downtown and pay the fines. And then he'd come back and start parking there again. Well, I've, I've, I'm looking at your archives, mm -hmm. I picked this out, <clears throat> and it's those tickets were two dollars. <laughs> that might be fairly cheap parking. <laughs> Well, I knew of a neighbor who also did the same thing downtown. And all you had to do was move your car. So this person would come out of their state office, go to the car. All you had to do was move it. I mean, you could just push your car if they had room in the front. So that, that the, the so, marking changed. Yeah, the, the chalk mark changed. Instead of, instead of getting a state permit, permit, parking permit. Yeah. One of the things that also was happening then is has been probably fairly well resolved for us now. We've got the roundabouts and they seem to work. But we had, what was it called? The Ferndale connector that we argued about so much? Yeah, the Ferndale connector. Excuse me a minute, Mike. I'm going to sip here. The Ferndale connector was intended to be a five-lane road or a road that connected five lanes at Poland, at over, there it is, <laughs> Hillsborough, where, or Poland Road crosses over. Right. That was to be five lanes connected. Basically, we're trying to get the, the, the connection between uh, Clark Avenue Correct. and Hillsborough Street, Clark Avenue and, and, the, and the village there. And so um, part of the, of the planning that would require Isabella Henderson's sister uh, what was her name? Uh, Riley, Mrs. Riley, Riley. Mrs. Riley, who was Russ Stevenson's grandmother, I think. I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, that her place would have to be condemned because it was a primary property in, in the way of the thing. So she fought that. She put uh, probably all her sums and all her energies into fighting that and was successful. And that stayed the, the putting in there. So I, I remember being in a meeting one time and I, would, I, I was more interested in what was going on. Park Drive was pretty much a raceway sometimes. Mm -hmm. We had little children. But I, I think I said one time, I'll drive a bulldozer through that house if they can get it. But after I went in the house and saw the map and I walked around the never. No, no, that's a gold mine. I think there was about three acres back there. Isn't that about yeah. right for that property? And that's a real yeah. treasure. And then, uh, so when Russ, and that finally when they said, you know, he said, you're going to have that name to it. Historic property. I thought that's got a Chinaman sense, but I got me dead. And no sooner got it, and they just happened to blade some new cement, and in front of his place. And so he wrote that information on the cement. And I think, I guess it's still there. I can't say I've actually seen it, but it sounds makes yeah makes good. So you got to be creative, you know. One of the one of the houses close to you. Uh, did we call it the Pinto House? One time, yeah, down Haley, the corner. Yeah, Haley, that that was a real problem place. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they. Um, my understanding that that was Smee York's maternal grandmother's home originally. Okay. But when we moved there, it was had a lot of girls in it, and girls seem to be worse tenants than boys. They're yeah. they're squealier and they drink, they attract the boys and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> 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 and um, so. And then Haley, unfortunately, got hold of the house immediately across the way, which was owned by a Satterfield family. And I remember we contacted them, tried to get them to ease up a bit or sell it to us or whatever the case may be, which, which didn't work. So they sold it to Haley. And then the interesting thing, thing about that, that situation with the Haley properties and so forth is his mother and father were extremely nice people. And we got to know them. And they were very discouraged by what Jerry himself was doing. The other angle to the whole thing is my daughter, my son was dating his daughter. <laughs> but we'd try not to mix. <laughs> but no, it, uh, I, I can't remember how. And then there was a time when uh, uh, there was somebody coming around from that house that was stealing things. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, let's see what else happened. Out there. Well, that, oh, that and then the other one, one across the street, one of the residents said, you know what? I've seen that man's 
picture, one of the residents in the building said, I've seen that man's picture in the post office. <laughs> and so the police came. On a Sunday morning, I walked out to get my paper, and I looked, and I could see at least four police cars right there, and they turned around your house, and they were getting, as I recall it, it was, they were, they were arresting a man who was wanted from the, for the grisly murder of his girlfriend in Virginia Beach or something like that. But, but you know, all of that, I can't particularly remember how, how Jerry ended that, how we ended that chapter with Jerry. Well, one of the things that ha happened is they filed a claim against us, uh, with, uh, housing and urban development. Oh, that's right. That uh, several of us signed the letter. Chris, I think Chris Grossman wrote it. Several of us signed it, and then they charged us with racial discrimination. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I know I had a guy on the phone in Washington, and I wouldn't let him get off the phone with me. And I just—I think I just melted him down. I kept talking to him and telling him, "We're not that kind of people. This is not that kind of situation." And and finally, he just—I think—I think when he hung up, there was part of him was a puddle. And the rest of it was barely hanging on to the phone. But that, that those were some of that was difficult for us. Yeah, yeah. And what, did you have air conditioning? Have what? Air conditioning. That's the last one. Did you have air conditioning? <laughs> Heavens no. no. Nor did we for a long time. Right. Our children were always angry at us because we got air conditioning after they left. They thought that. Was <laughs> My children. Put in the attic, but they didn't say anything. <laughs> they, no, I, I do not like air conditioning. I do not have air conditioning. And probably some of the stuff that we got into, particularly noise issues, would not, I understand, and I'm not necessarily pat my or anything about, probably would not have ever come to think because now they, because people have air conditioning and people have heat and the windows are closed, a lot can go on and there's a heck of a lot goes on because people don't hear. The location of our house on that curve on Groveland was a direct line, for example, to, to uh, uh, what Smoot's development yeah. and all that noise. But only because of my window was open. If I pulled my window closed, I probably could have had a good well, night's sleep. We could hear it at our house, too. And then you hear things like dumpsters. The dumpsters put, they put dumpsters in the back of Daryl's parking lot. No, who hears that? We even have that at our place. Who hears the dumpsters? But I'll tell you what, one of my victories. I, <laughs> I thought, I'm going to get the number of that truck if it's the last thing I do. Threw on some clothes on my jammy, some white slip on after this guy, and I get his number and turned it in. And that took care of because they weren't supposed to be there earlier than 5 o'clock. But shopping centers are different. But little areas like that were only supposed to be no earlier than seven. So all these things. And the other thing when it comes to the noise issues, you don't realize that even though you drive, you start at Overland Road and you go down Park Drive and you go up and down, you don't really realize the topography of the area until you start dealing with noise issues. And the reason I say that is because, for example, uh, there was a restaurant open below uh, Harris Cedar, it's now House Cedar, uh, or Kroger, or whatever it is, uh, and it was called Nelson's. Do you know it was a high class sort of restaurant? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, like well, the fellow was named, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Nelson. Mm -hmm. And so he, things were going down, so he decided that they would have some outdoor music in the space between them and where uh, Supercuts and that, that area. I mean, you're talking speakers as big as steamer trunks. And even, even so with a, with the little German band and they all started using loudspeakers. So, so the one time that bless his heart, he, he would come over and he would tell we're having a concert. He would, he would do whatever and he would bring a bottle of really good scotch. He never, <laughs> but even a better deal, but we didn't take it was, uh, what's her name? Uh, Lynn Worth, the gal, yeah, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn Worth, Worth yeah. yeah. Okay, she offered us a, be a place at the beach. <laughs> so well, those are the kind well of by that time, Marilyn, you had a reputation <laughs> because because of uh, because of Hillsborough Square. Oh yeah. Uh, let's let's talk about 
I don't know if everybody has an idea of what Hillsborough Square was, but to our end of the neighborhood, it's like Glenwood South is to the other end of the neighborhood. Okay. Well, where does that think? It's, you know, it's... Well, nurse, but the other thing I was thinking, Dave, the other day is the fact we talk about the taverns that were particularly troublesome, but then you have to also figure there was the Daryl's Restaurant there, and the Players' Retreat was also there, and then how many, four? Four or five more taverns. taverns. Yeah. And, and you, 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 uh, there's this, there's this wonderful letter here, this, this Mary Lou presented, it's, this is, I mean, uh, here's, she says, there are a mountain of wrongdoings, the following violations in many instances, disorderly conduct, littering, in parking lots, outside the taverns, in the residential and business neighborhoods, and also in Pullman Park. Mm -hmm. Alcohol consumption on the public sidewalk, blocking public right away on the sidewalk. Remember, he built the concrete barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, noise abuses, destruction of property, drug sales and use. Uh, so Mary Lou made this presentation to the city council on our behalf. This letter is... That's four pages. Let me see. Can't believe I did that. I believe you did it. <laughs> okay, I wanted to read this to you. This is, this is how she closes her letter. The neighborhood I represent is one of basically tolerant people, well acquainted with both the rigors and pleasantries of living in inner city. Our pursuits as they relate to our community are those of the average citizen. Peace, privacy, quiet, and freedom from abuse. Since ours is a community constantly threatened by the indulgences of others, we must watchdog our rights. I'm a watchdog. <laughs> we do not intend to relax our efforts. What is needed in seeking the solutions to the problem brought before you tonight is the courage to uphold the spirit and intentions of the laws of our city, the strength to require and insist upon responsibility with privilege and the need to exercise good judgment when the laws do not specifically provide for it, respectfully submitted, Mary Lou Ike. <laughs> and she had her pals with you. You had Jack Wardlaw, mm -hmm. and you had Frank Evans from the parking lot. Parking. You had McLaurin. Uh, there, were, there was a, a large group of people. Does I don't know if people understand. I don't want to overemphasize it, but what was happening there? There were five or six taverns. They were playing music outside. Oh, all kinds of, a lot of people outside. There was somebody that was seriously injured, I think, because uh, somebody dropped a whatever. Uh, but the sidewalks were filled, and it was just, just bad news, bad news. Um, but one, one thing I have to say, the climate in which... The businesses that that the, the residents got involved in with the city and so forth was so so different because that that letter, for example, was a result of well, plenty of good help from Gail Smith, who was a city clerk, and people had time to spend with you to help you and be and they acted interested. Another person was Marion Block, Chris Terrell's mother. She was, a, I thought, her very fine council person, represented the area. And uh, who was some of the other? Tom Irwin. Tom Irwin could have retired early, the amount of time he gave. And he didn't even live in the, in the throes of our neighborhood. But he was very generous, and he contributed his time. And, and there were lots and lots and lots of meetings. But anyway, that... Uh, and this initially started with, I remember being at a meeting at your house when Smoot came and talked about the project initially. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And it, it would it involved carriages going up and down Hillsborough Street, horse-drawn carriages to the Velvet Cloak. Uh, he had been in France and was very impressed with, uh, with that sophisticated world, you know. And that was going to happen in downtown. <laughs> the corner of Oberlin and Hillsborough. <laughs> the uh, 
it got to be one of those town gown sort of things because mm -hmm. the, the, uh, there were editorials in the uh, uh, technician about how, uh, you know, everybody hates us, nobody loves us. The, uh, um, they've torn you, down. Yeah. You have that cartoon? I've got, oh, I've got the cartoon. Yeah, let me find the cartoon. And then, let's see, Hillsborough Square was torn down in um, 1973, I believe. And then what was the... the uh, the people that tore that down. Uh, oh, what was the name of that company? Because they painted up a sign as though they they danced their danced their last dance and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, I've got the cartoon here, Mary Lou. I know I do. I know you do. Just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep talking, Mary Lou, while I'm running. The cartoon. Well, he even fancied a swimming pool up on the second deck. You can imagine that. Yeah, you know, it, 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 uh. I think the man was well intended, but, uh, Smoot was a member of the, uh, what family was it, Jerry? You all know, uh, well known family, money family from, uh, Wake Forest, was it? Uh, and his yeah, wife was. was a real big, uh, top of the building was a big bar. Uh huh. It's a whole, where Daryl was. Uh -huh. oh. Mary, I promised that cartoon's in here, and after <laughs> a while, it'll be out for people to see. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was. It was it had something to do about asking for a date or something. Yeah. 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 So what other what other things? Well, the, we did? then we had uh, let's see, the Strictly Parker. What else do we have? Well, we we. Uh, uh, we had something else going on at the same time. The subway in Cameron Village was going on at the same time. And that, that had an impact oh, yeah. on our neighborhood because it was a, it, between, if you wanted to get from the uh, Cameron Village underground, the subway, to Crazy Zach's, and you, didn't, you, you were too drunk to drive, you walked up Park Drive. Yeah. We, we remember a few of those. Yeah. So the other thing, before we moved, one of the things I was observing, and I'm observing about these things because I do it myself. You know what I'm saying? I like to find shortcuts, in other words. So what was beginning to happen, particularly with the roundabout construction, that's what created this curiosity, but it continued afterwards. People would come down from uh, Overland, come down Park Drive, go over Groveland, down Benahan, and out. To Hillsboro, and that way you could avoid the roundabout. You could avoid that, that stuff, that kind of stuff. So, but oh, and a, a parking thing was really funny. There was a a, a student who lived down on um, let's see, one of the east or west park drive. No, not that far down. It was still within the restrictive right. parking thing. So one day there was a knock on the door, and this is whomever answered the door, and the fellow wanted to pay it for his parking space. And it turns out the daughter was told the guy that he had to pay for the parking space. Oh. <laughs> so that was it. You found it. I found it. I knew it was in there. This brings up a point. What, one of the things that we had in Raleigh during that time was two newspapers. Mm -hmm. We had the Morning News and Observer, which is a pretty good paper. And we had the Raleigh Times, which tended to neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And most everything that happened that was noisy and busy and happening in the neighborhood, the Raleigh Times would cover. And they covered a lot of the things that yeah. happened in Cameron Park. And this cartoon was in one of them. It says, how dare you? I've never been so insulted in all my life. What makes you think that I'm that type of girl? I'm on my first date. My mother warned me. And the guy's thinking to himself over here. All I did was ask her to go to Hillsborough Square. So, <laughs> so the, the, the whole... We had Guy Munger and we had Mary and Gregory, both of them. We did. Coolest. Yes, we did. we did. We so, did. So why is it important to be vigilant? You, you've been a, you, you've been a, you know, if, if I think of you, I, I you know, I love you, and we're such good friends. Yeah. But I also love you because you've always been vigilant, and you've, you've thought about things. 
What? Why is, why is it important? What's, what makes you do that? Well, somewhere along in life, I think maybe from my English father, <laughs> there's a right and wrong. And if something tells you that this is not right, then you have a moral, in quotes, moral obligation to make it right or do your best to make it right. And so I guess that's about all the best we can do. And also, uh, maybe, maybe you all are territorial. So this is my territory. <laughs> And so if it's being intruded upon and, and making major interruptions to my life, then it behooves me to stand up for myself and, and for everybody else who's involved and try to correct it. But I don't, uh, well, I won't even editorialize on that. <laughs> no, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, but you know, I, where I live, people are talking about, my children say this, my children tell me this. I thought, what's this children? You know, telling their parents stuff, what to do, what is that stuff? <laughs> and so I thought, you know what, I don't recall my father, or mother, particular father, and all he had to do was go, <clears throat> <laughs> But even without, uh, somehow or other, uh, you, you try to figure out where, where you got this notion of right and wrong and stuff, and I just don't, <coughs> I just, maybe it was demonstrated, I, I didn't, don't know, but anyway. It, uh, it's been a nice ride, and I, uh, I managed to keep my fingers in the pie over at Whitaker Glen. I uh, where, where she is the president of the residence council. Does that surprise you? <laughs> Does that surprise you? <laughs> it's, let's just put it this way, Marianne. It's a little bit different than working with the city. <laughs> but nevertheless. I said a word about your real dogs. You remember those real dogs? Oh, yeah. We remember when when you moved in. When we moved in, Niffer was the only one we had left, and Niffer had a mind of his or her own. The big uh, white Great Pyrenees. Oh, oh yeah, uh, that was uh, Blossom. Blossom. Well, and you also had Niffer too, didn't you? Well, Niffer was one of Blossom. Blossom. Carl never had the experience of kittens or any dogs or anything like that. So he decided that this Pyrenees should be bred. <laughs> so that happened. And on our 10th anniversary, she had 11 puppies. So that kind of interrupted our anniversary thing. <laughs> well, so the result, however, was that she had a condition, and I, I cannot tell you exactly what it was, but it struck me similar to a, what is Billy Rubin or something like that condition of people. So the result was that the, the puppies that nursed the most died and they you could see their bellies turning sore and they would die so we lost four of them so anyway son phil wanted to have a dog of his own and eric had claimed nipper or a blossom rather and to the extent and if if eric had a friend over the friend slept on the floor because blossom had the place in the bed so <laughs> phil phil however didn't like that arrangement but nipper was his dog yeah we 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 lived in a different time then yeah. because Niffer would come down the alley to our house. Okay. Well, that and, must have been Blossom, then. Right? Yeah, and, but, but Coco would come up the alley to your house. Yeah. Yeah. And it was before we were all concerned about keeping our dogs on a leash. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but the, the real fun that we've had is that uh, I bought this um, dog at Logan's. It was on sale. It was an old... It's a life-size old English sheepdog, and it weighs about 200 pounds. And so that's what he's talking to. So lo and behold, there was one left, and next thing you know, they have the other dog. And well, they, they they put it on sale, and we could we, no, we it yeah, on yeah sale. we couldn't turn it down. No, you couldn't. Okay, so so you you've been vigilant. What about the just the, what what's been the joyful thing about living in Cameron? I can remember, I'll, I'll answer that this way. Uh, the place that I first lived that I can remember as a child, I thought it was, when we moved, my family moved to Terrace Park. I thought that was the most wondrous place ever a child could be. We moved to Cameron Park. I had that same feeling. It's the most wondrous child. It had all the ingredients that a kid needs. It had, you had, it was free, it was secure enough that you could be free and the kids could do it. Close enough to these blah, 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 blah. You all know the, the attraction. 
And so even at Whitaker Glen, it has some limitations, but it's still one of the most wondrous places to be. Did you guys have a, a swim pool? <laughs> Pruitt, the people of Pruitt Health owns Whitaker Glen. And so they're starting on a, a, a development program. And one of the things, now, have you, have you all been, been there? You have some idea what we're talking about? Okay, in the middle of that courtyard somewhere, that right outside between the buildings and outside the dining room, they have plans to build a pool, an outdoor pool. <laughs> well, I was asking about your outdoor pool all oh. apart. On, oh, I'm on, sorry. On Groveland. Well, you can tell it's really hot in my mind. Yeah, I know. You, 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 you're oh, already okay. trying to solve Our that pool. problem. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay, we were fortunate when we lived in Vermont that some friends who lived up the road from us, who had lots of money and built, uh, they had a, a swimming pool for their grandchildren when they came to visit. So the kids grew older, and so they built them a pond. So now they had this pool. And they came one day and said, we've checked over your situation, and we think you should have this pool. So they gave it to us. And so um, the kids were really little, but so we brought it with us when we moved to uh, Raleigh. And so we put it up and occupied one third of the backyard. And it was, so there were, and it was a, had aluminum siding, had, you know, aluminum siding and then the liner, so forth and so on. So, uh, so there are three seasons <laughs> this pool. <laughs> one was for the kids, the little kids, but you, the, the boys could invite their friends, but one of their parents had to come with them. And I remember it, only one person did that. And this mother's standing, swim, Jonathan, swim. I can't stand here all day and wait for you. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only person who came. So then the next group was um, the young guys like Dave. Yeah. And they would come and play basketball because the basketball goal was over it. And it's a one of that. That was, that, a, that was a great place for to play basketball. Oh, yeah, we came up there. Yeah, they was, they, yeah. There were your, your, your guys, David yeah. and David Munger. And then, then Tom Funk and I would play up there and some others. And then that guys. pool, it's a wonder it didn't fall over. I mean, <laughs> the side going back and forth, these big guys jumping all over. You weigh a little less when you're coming up out of the pool. You might a little higher. <laughs> and then there was the final finale use, which near the end of the summer when the water was cool and the men had other things to do besides play basketball. Then we had our cocktail hour there. and we <laughs> So we had a styrofoam thing that would hold the glasses and the ashtrays. And Carl tried to put an aluminum chair down him, but it wouldn't stay down. So we had to stand up. And so that was what concluded the summer of, of the swimming pool. But, and, and there would be a day when I would come on Woodburn and then turn up Park Drive, and I'd see the water running down the street. And I'd say, <laughs> oh, no, the pool is going down. Yeah, so, yeah. And that, would be, that would mark the end of summer. For that sure. would be the end of summer. No, those were those were good days. Basketball in the backyard. Yeah. Anything else you want to tell these people? Well, I kind of miss being young and miss being uh, away from all the activity and even even the grumbles. You know, they seem more productive here. Would you say sounds like more productive grumbles than we experience? <laughs> but anyway, I, I hope. Think, I think the aliens didn't bother you. Those dogs. <laughs> I mean, they were formidable. <laughs> so, anyway, it's a great place. I know I can tell by the happy looks on the faces of everybody and the, and the sense of community that you have. That's that's really great. Because you start, I don't have a strong feeling at all that these newer communities with the houses of government, like, they have, even know what it's all about. They really don't know. No. So, well, thank you very much for. The opportunity to be here. Tell us about your garden. You had a beautiful garden. And how did you decide how it was going to look? And were there, when you were in the midst of gardening, were there other common part gardeners? And you sort of well, with? it was um, Katie Haynes, and I used to describe our garden as uh, spontaneous and miscellaneous. <laughs> No way. But the obvious thing was, if the backyard, I don't know whether it's still there or not. Is the grapevine still, grapevine's still no, there? No, it's not no. there. Okay. I don't know, but you still garden. 
in yeah. our garden or over where we're living. Yeah, so it, that's very spontaneous. In this <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so we had the grapevine, and it was a natural to have a patio, right? So that was there. And, um, and at that time, I belonged to the Raleigh Garden Club and the Men's Garden Club. It was the Men's Garden Club. I think it's Wake County Garden Club. I you were president of the Men's Garden Club. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you something about that. <laughs> what happens in an organization, if they let women in, then the man, men seem to find an advantage to that, and they let them. So <laughs> the Men's Garden Club. Although, interesting enough, there never was a man's secretary. <laughs> Although there's women, but I, I thank you for the compliment. Garden, gardening is good for the, the soul and for the, just your health and everything like that. So, were there other gardeners in the neighborhood that you discuss gardening with? Well, Katie, when she came, I don't. Uh, I remember Jerry Highsmith tried to get uh, a spinoff from the Oakwood. Garden. Matter of fact, they were the ones that got the uh, the pink dump truck. Is that this uh, the garbage truck? Pink garbage truck. I don't know whether it still exists or not. They had something. I don't know. I don't know. That's a very legitimate question, Chuck. But I don't exactly know how. But anyway, the uh, there was a, a fig bush there that was put there by the former owners of the house. And the grapevine. And you had the what? What's a walking stick? Oh, the Harry Lauder walking stick tree. Yeah, yeah. Our grandchildren always loved to come up there. We, you know, we didn't care whether you were there or not. We had granted We just came and walk, walk through the, and they walked through the garden, walk, walk the paths, and come over. And you know, we had one that always wanted to kiss the dog. Yeah. Yeah. Big card. Beanstalk. The beanstalk. Yeah, I sent them to the back door. Yep. The, beanstalk. the what? A, a beanstalk. Bean, did you raise beans at the back door? It, 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 it's it's oh, the beanstalk. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what was that? Oh, I forgot about that. And on around the corner, it, it grew furiously. Yeah. I remember yeah, that. It would be, I was in the house. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't remember what that is. That's one of them right there. Thank you, Will. Thank you for your stubborn on break. Oh, wow. <laughs> Let me, let me read you this because I, I wrote this. I want to close with this. Okay. Scripture in both the Old Testament and the New Testament speak about the importance of loving, looking out for our neighbors. And you have lived a life of loving and looking out for your neighbors. Some people see a problem and move on. Some people talk about stuff and move along. But there are folks like you, Mary Lou, who see problems and work to fix them. I know our neighborhood is so much better than it could have been because of you. At the beginning of each show, Mr. Rogers would sing these words along in his song. It would be, I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. And I'm so glad I have and that we have. And thank you for being our neighbor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.